Hi. So after five videos, if you have been following along, you already know everything you need to implement your very own federated learning pipelines using Flower for simulation. You know how to take an off-the-shelf dataset and partition it so every client gets its own local dataset. You know how to design your Flower clients and in particular how to set up the feed and evaluate methods that are the key elements for clients to do local drawing and local evaluation. You know how to choose a strategy and how to configure elements like how many clients are involved in tr during the feed, how many clients are involved in the evaluate, how does the function that performs global evaluation looks like, for instance. And you know already how to start a simulation and how to assign different CPU and GPU resources to your clients. If you have been following along with the code and maybe you have even launched some of the simulations in your systems. So you already have an idea on how you can see, you can configure your simulations so you maximize resource utilizations. What this video is about is about highlighting other, com other considerations that you might need in order to understand why sometimes allocating more GP resources to your clients doesn't necessarily translate into faster simulations. So this is what this video is about. And also it's an invitation to tell you that if, if you are really particularly interested on simulating federated learning workloads, we are welcoming any contributor that wants to take our virtual client engine uh, to the next level. So please uh, join us on GitHub or ping us on Slack which you can find the, the link below if you have any suggestions or if you want to contribute. Let's get on with the video. Open the main. Let's just make this small. All right, so we started from the main. And in the main, we what we get right from the beginning is we are parsing our Hydra config. Hydra is a very powerful YAML-based configuration system that we are we are only starting to learn how to use in this tutorial, but in the follow-up tutorial, we're going to show you how to close to, uh, let's say, I'm not going to say master Hydra, but use it in a much more effective way. So this is how the entry point of our experiment. The first thing we did was to prepare our dataset. And if we look into the dataset script, the dataset in the, from the main, we call this function called prepare dataset, which downloads the data set we want to use for federation. In this case, we are using MNIST. And because MNIST is not a pre-partition data set, we need to create these partitions. So we can assign a portion of the data set to every client. Uh, how many partitions do we create? How do we partition this data in these many partitions? That's entirely up to the, the person that design experiments to decide. In this case, we set our config to be using 100 clients, so we are going to create 100 partitions. We decide that every partition is going to be of the same size, in this case, partition len, and then we do our very standard random partitioning of our data set. So in this way, we are most likely obtaining data par data set partitions where every partition has, a, has been created by uniformly sampling from the main training set. So this is often called RID partitioning and is one of the simplest, if not the simplest setting regarding all the problems associated with data heterogeneity in FL, which is a very re active research area. Then what we did next is we took all these training partitions and we split them into two, one for training and one for validation. And we do this for every client. So every client has a training set and a validation set that is derived from that training set. And we also, uh, constructed a test loader that is going to be passed to the server. So after um, preparing our data set, what we did was to define this client function. And we, we define our client function, which does nothing but return a, a function that will be able to instantiate a client of a particular client ID. We do it like this because this is the way the virtual client engine will create these clients, these virtual clients at the beginning of every round, if the client ID with a particular ID is told to participate. And this Flower client is a client class inheriting from non client in Flower, which look like this. It has two main methods. 
one of the main methods is fit, which receives from the server the parameters of the global model and a set of instructions, like for example, hyperparameters to use. And then it just does training. And this training looks like standard training uh, function you would use in, in this case, PyTorch. Because remember, even though Flower is framework agnostic, in some points of the framework, you need to decide what ML framework you want to use. Here I use PyTorch, but you could have used TensorFlow, JAX, or any other framework. So my client in fit will call the train function, which looks like a very standard train looking in, in PyTorch, and it will return the parameters of the locally trained model. So what the client sends back to the server is not, no longer the original parameters you see, but the model changed from training with a local uh, data set. And the other very relevant method in our client is to is called evaluate, which what it does is receives the, par the parameters of the global model and evaluates them in the local validation set in this case and returns some metrics like the loss and the cash. Then, once we have this uh, function that to generate clients, what we, we did was to define the strategy. In this case, we chose Fed Average, which, which is the most popular aggregation strategy out there. It's not the best, but for our particular example, it works uh, fairly well. And we parameterize it with, with a bunch of parameters, which defines how many clients per round we're going to use for training, how many clients per round we're going to use for evaluation. And we've passed two functions that are going to be called by the, at different points in the strategy to uh, set different, to configure uh, around in different ways. For example, with configure fit, what we construct here is a dictionary of hyperparameters that we want to send to the client during fit. So this config here will be this Python dictionary. Then we pass another we obtain another function that we, we call evaluate function, which is here. And this function is going to be called by the strategy at the end of the aggregation process. So remember, at the end of the aggregation, with all the updated models received by the clients, we obtain a new global model. And what the way this is done in Fed Average is by just taking the average of this model sent by the clients. So now with the new global model, we want to evaluate it on a potentially well, as it is in this case, on a global testnet. So the, the parameters of this global model is in, come here from the strategy. We instantiate the model. We copy the parameters into the model state dict, because this is the way uh, you do it in PyTorch. And then we call test, which test is a, a very standard looking function in, which defines how to evaluate a model in, in PyTorch. And with that, that was the last argument we passed to our strategy. And the next stage was just to directly start the simulation, passing uh, the function that creates clients, passing the strategy, configuring the server for a particular number of rounds that is obtained from our config, and also telling it how many clients there are in total. And finally, we saw that we can set this optional argument if we want to change the resources that should be available to a client. By default, the number of resources is just a single CPU and zero GPUs, but we wanted to test, okay, what happens if I give it two, CP, two CPUs and only an eighth of the GP resources? Why are you, I chose an eighth is because the model we are using is so lightweight that we can pack many of them in, in the particular GPU I have in my system. And finally, this, the simulation will, ru will run for the specified number of rounds and return metrics obtained during this process in the history, which we can very conven conveniently save into the directory that is created automatically by Hydra by fetching what that directory path is and saving the results, for instance, as a pickle like it is shown here. And with this, I hope it was a fast enough summary of everything we have seen. So let's just jump into the final section of this video where we're going to do a wrap up of this tutorial. 
So congratulations, you have completed the first part in this video tutorial series. I hope you have enjoyed. Before jumping into the second part, I just want to remind you that you are very welcome to join our Flower Slack. It's a very vibrant community of over 2000 federated learning enthusiasts. Some of them are researchers like myself, some others are engineers, some are students, some are people from industry, some others are just curious to see what federated learning is about. So no matter what is your background or your situation or your knowledge level about coding or even federated learning, you are very welcome to join. Uh, in the next video, we're going to start with part two, which what we're going to be doing is we're going to take exactly the same code base we have written in this first part with no changes, and we're going to see how we can enhance it by using the HIDA configuration system. So see you in the next video.